Hello, I'm Lois Vallely, Chief Reporter of Money Marketing, and today I am joined by Rich Denning, who is Chief Executive of the M&G Wealth Platform. Um, and we are going to be talking about some key market trends that are coming into financial services and how they are affecting the platform market. Um, Rich, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Perhaps you could start off by telling our viewers a little bit about yourself and your role at M&G Wealth. Yeah, so Rich Denning, I've been working in financial services since I left school, um, very young, a very long time ago. Um, joined a business called Prudential and I've kind of circuitously ended up back in a in a group that um, a part of a group that owns that business. Um, last 21 years this year, I've been in platforms um, and I think I've done just about everything in platforms by now. Um, probably not close to platform, don't intend to start now. Um, but I've done all sorts of things, built platforms from scratch, integrated, merged, built IT systems. So, um, and, and now within um, M&G Wealth, so M&G Wealth is a division of M&G Group. Uh, I look after the platform as chief exec and also look after operations across uh, the particularly the retirement account um, business and uh, running quite a big change portfolio of, of improvement across um, M&G Wealth. Great, thank you. Um, you've talked quite a lot in the press recently about um, private equity. So how do you see that affecting the platform market? How has it affected it so far and how do you think it will affect it in the future? Well, I think, I mean, you started with talk about finance, trends in financial services. I think that the interesting thing for me was private equity as a trend in financial services. Uh, and so whether that's it, you look at the continued private equity investment in businesses like FNZ, all funds, um, and how much they've got sort of powered those businesses to be kind of international um, businesses and, that, and how PE firms have entered and have been entering over the last probably 10 years now, um, advice businesses and how that's changed and how that's helped fuel quite a lot of consolidation um, within um, advice businesses as well. So it's interesting for, for me, I, I did a, a stint for a few months at a private equity business consulting and it's interesting to kind of look at the private equity view of the market, which is that it's still expanding rapidly, that there is an advice gap, that uh, the private equity house views of the world of the margins are, are will get bigger, actually, not smaller. Our, our own views are the opposite, actually, but they believe there's, there's margin upside um, and that they believe that I think the, the wealth market is the fifth in the biggest in the in the um, on the planet. So I think the, the private equity businesses continue to see wealth management in the UK as a growth opportunity. And that's why they've invested and are investing in platforms. And it's done the same in um, platforms or doing the same in platforms it did in advice. It's helping consolidate, you know, that I think I started probably the biggest platform when I started the only one really was a business called Scandia, which is now Quilter. Um, we got up to over 40 pl investment platforms, um, which is too many. I know the market's expanded. It's probably approaching, we're going to approach 1 trillion within the next few years, but still too many platforms, um, falling margins. Um, and I think the private equity businesses are helping consolidate the, the platform market at a rate of knots that it wouldn't have naturally got to itself if it would have been provider to provider mm. no that makes sense is that something you see continuing then or do you think it'll yeah. slow down yeah no i think it will i think there's still too many i think a lot of the um, d2c platforms the cost of acquisition looks really high versus the margins and i think they do well i think the numbers that a lot of the newer platforms post look look good but on really thin margins and it's hard to see how you can how you get a competitive differentiation if you're a subscale smallish player. Um, and I think you see, I mean, Embark probably is the first big consolidator. Now it's part of, obviously part of Lloyd's, but um, you see what's happening at, at Novia. Um, Anna Kappa bought Novia Wealth Time and a, and a platform, a, a small book of business um, off of Amber. Uh, we just expect that to continue. Great. Um, obviously, a big thing on people's minds at the moment is the consumer duty, which I think comes into full force in um, July next year. How do you see that affecting um, the platforms? Well, consumer duty for me is really interesting. I mean, obviously, it's uh, it, uh, I'm old enough now to have seen a lot of regulation, but this is a reasonably, reasonably unique set of um, 
regulations in that it's both principles and rules. So there are things we have to do under consumer duty. And there are different things depending on whether you're a life company, a platform and an advice business. So there's a lot of analysis going on across the market at the moment about what that actually means. So whether that's disclosure on documentation in terms of fees and charges through to you know, the, the kind of um, way we interact on an ongoing basis at the moment, uh, most, most platforms, certainly most advice platforms, rely almost entirely on the advisor to communicate with the customer. Consumer duty makes a requirement on us to do to, to do that better, um, but there's a there's some cross cutting um, things a, across consumer duty around principles around the culture of the firm and around how we behave as senior managers in there that I think are really interesting. Um, we've got as an industry and to get to the end of October and to present to all of our boards what our plans are, and then as you say, we've got until next summer to implement those plans. Uh, and at the moment, I think people are still working out that it's easy to work out what the rules bit mean. And, you know, changing disclosure documents and stuff is relatively easy. It's harder to work out how you change a firm's culture and how you change behaviours. But with that, we've got to do it. And that's what we're working on at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Um, and how do you see in terms of customer needs? How do you see um, platforms role changing, if at all, uh, once the consumer duty comes in? I mean, I think that, that I mean, plat when I started doing this, believe it or not, um, people didn't think platforms had much of a future. Thought it was a bit of a fad, really. Um, and that the, when we started, what was the Celestia platform? We had no more than fifty funds on there because um, we kind of thought that was kind of breaking new ground. I mean, at the moment, I think our own platform's got nearly five thousand. Um, so I think, but you know, platforms are here to stay. They do a really important job, and you know, we've helped bring the cost of servicing customers down we've helped the advice market platforms are now helping the d2c market but ultimately i think we we see them helping bridge the advice gap if we can produce as an industry if we can produce a set of solutions whether that's hybrid advice through to a, a relatively inexpensive platforms through to relatively inexpensive good value investment solutions if we can all do that as an industry then and i think platforms have an important part it's kind of the glue that sits and holds all that together um, and i think platforms will continue to do that across all the different sectors and all the different markets that we serve i think hybrid advice is a particularly interesting one actually because um i write about it quite a lot and how would you define it because i know people define it differently how would you what would you say hybrid advice is so I, I think I've been, been um, be careful what I say, because it's definitely, I'm not a qualified advisor. My dad's just sold his business. My dad's an intelligent guy. He's 70 odd years old and he's got a relatively small final salary pension. This industry does not help people like my dad with his 120, 130,000. Um, but, you know, my dad's pretty IT savvy, he would go online to a hybrid type solution that could help him kind of do all of the fact finding and everything that he, he needs to do. And I think that's where hybrid can help. I think it can help consumers, customers understand what it is they've got, what the potential options are. And ultimately, I think it can, if you're, you know, my, my son's 21, my son would want to pick up the telephone to a human being if his life depended on it. He'd probably complete that hybrid journey. He'd probably go, he's got a, excuse me, he's got a um, ISA with Vanguard. You know, George, George will go that route and he'll manage his own ISA. My dad gets to the moment of truth um, and says, that's a lot of money. I want to talk to somebody now. So, you know, my dad's actually found his way through um, the money advice service and, and he's ended up speaking to somebody. Um, but I, I think that's where hybrid can, can and will help. I think also it's going to help advisors. I think if advisors can em embrace it at their own end of the process with, with that kind of fact finding, with getting people to upload their documents digitally and all that kind of I think an advisor it takes hours, literally hours, four or five hours of fact finding to, to collect all of somebody's personal information. I think hybrid can help with that. I'm of a generation where I'm on the fence as to whether within my lifetime, a whole bunch of people are going to complete all of those hybrid um, D to, on a D to Z basis. I think it's still quite scary. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's an interesting one, certainly. I think I'm sort of in between 
um, in terms of I, I do quite like speaking to someone on the phone, but yeah. I also yeah. like to complete quite a lot of things digitally. So I think I'm in the between same. generation, I think. Yeah, I mean, I've just, I've just, um, we've got a, a electric car scheme at work, and I've just ordered a Tesla, and that's a really weird buying experience. Nothing's done with any um, showroom or a human being, and you just get text messages, and it's a contactless delivery. They send you, they send you videos, and you have to read vid videos of how to use the car, and, and on the day they just deliver it to your house. Um, and then you fill out a form and you you drive away. So it's going. So can, I think the world's changing. It's going to be an interesting um, change. But I, I do think hybrid, again, hybrids here to stay. I think we're all kind of working out. And there's people. A lot of the banks have invested in and the mutuals have invested in it heavily, right? Because they're ultimate D to C, and people are going into branches. But I think you you do all the statistics say people get to that moment of truth when it's their life savings, particularly their pension. And that's the moment they probably want to t still want to talk to a human being. Yeah, definitely. No, totally agree. Um, I did just finally want to ask you about, so I've seen quite a lot of the um, platforms figures, sort of over, overall platforms figures that have come out for the first half of the year. And it looks like flows are generally down. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, um, sort of why it is, what you think's happening there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I generally the platform flows are, are, are stable i mean again i'm old enough now to have seen the the um the dot-com bubble burst early on and and the, the credit crisis in 08 it, it, generally platforms are pretty resilient because you're dealing with people moving money by and large that's already in the system um a lot of what you're seeing at the moment is nervousness to even do that nervousness for to have the conversation with a customer who may may have had a MIFID 10% drop letter, may have had more than one. There's definitely nervousness there. I think there's nervousness on behalf of customers to do anything different. And there and the, the definitely nervousness to invest in anything new. That includes topping up ISAs, topping up pensions. Um, and I think what if you saw if the industry produced redemptions, and I guess it does on, from gross and net. But I think that we, you'll see, we are seeing and we will see redemptions go up and withdrawals go up higher, and especially as we, we go into winter and people have to dig into their savings. Um, so, yeah, I mean, flows are down. We're expecting flows to continue to be down um, and we'll see what the government does next. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Rich. It's been really interesting to talk to you today. Good. Um, and to our viewers, if you would like to hear any more about key market trends, um, you can check out our podcast series and also a special report we've done on investment smoothing, um, both of which have been in association with Prue and M&G Wealth. And um, also check out any of our other amazing content on the Money Marketing website. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. Thank you. <laughs>